Uh, thank you. Oh, wait, that's not right. No? Yes. My name is Mark Dominus. In Chinese, my name is Thao Ming Zhu. And uh, my talk will have code in it. So it might be a good time to go to lunch early. <laughs> and I would like to think, thank uh, Ishigaki Kenichi for providing Japanese translation. Also, everybody involved in Yapsi for inviting me and bringing me to Japan. Also, Brian Ingerson for not taking off his clothes during his talk. Mm. Oh my gosh. Well, see, so years and years ago, Brian told me, I was calling him Ingy, and he said, oh no, please don't call me Ingy, call me Brian. So I was very careful to start calling him Brian. And now he's changed his mind, and I have not yet caught up. <laughs> yeah, it's a difficult world. Parsing, parsing is the process of taking unstructured input, like a sequence of characters, and then turning it into a data structure, like a record or an object or some kind of complicated thing that represents the data more directly than just a sequence of characters. This is something that every program has to do. Some of them do it just a little bit. Most of them do it a lot. For example, you have to read in a configuration file and decide what the configuration file means. And then probably you have some data structure in your program that represents the program configuration. So how do you turn the file, which is just an unstructured sequence of characters, into this configuration data structure? I'm really sorry. I'm from New York, and that means I talk too quickly. I try to slow down, but it never works. I'll try really hard. Also, in New York, we have a slightly funny dialect. Trailing consonants disappear. All the vowels turn in the same. If you want to ask me questions over the next two days, I would be glad to answer them. And uh, in the meantime, I apologize for my peculiar English. When I was first proposing my book, Higher Order Pearl, to publishers, one publisher said, are you sure you want to have a chapter about parsing? This does not seem like a good application of Pearl. Do people really do parsing? <laughs> people don't have to parse that often. I was boggled. Oh. So I had it published by a different publisher. <laughs> now, some people like closed systems. Closed system, the system just does what you need it to do. Somebody has thought ahead of time of all the things you're going to need to do, and for each thing you're going to do, they put a feature into their system, and when you need to do the thing, you use the feature. For example, Microsoft Windows. And when they get it right, and they figure out that what you need to do, then there's the thing, and you push the button, and it does the thing, and if they got it right, there it is. I like open systems better. Open systems, somebody has not tried to anticipate everything you want to do. They instead provide a bunch of modules that do simple things, and they provide a powerful system for assembling modules into more complex modules. And then you can assemble the complex modules into still more complex modules. So if you need to do something simple, maybe you use a simple module. And if you need to do something more complicated, you take some simple modules and put them together. So instead of having to anticipate every possible use case and push, provide a button for it, it should just be possible to assemble some set of modules to address every possible use case. For example, Unix. Unix has many small tools like cat and sed and Perl. <laughs> and then you assemble them with shell scripts and pipes and Perl. And it should also be pretty easy to build new modules like with shell and Perl. Both of these approaches have advantages. 
Open systems are very flexible, very powerful, potentially unlimited, because you can keep piling the modules together into more and more complicated modules to do more and more wonderful things. The drawback, you have to write shell scripts. You have to have some understanding. You have to know what the system is and understand its principles and be able to put the modules together. Not everybody can do that. Even people who can do that don't always want to. The reason these two slides are here, people say, why don't you just use parse rec descent? Well, this is the reason. Parse rec descent is a closed system. It's a very nice closed system. I like it a lot. Closed systems are good in a lot of ways. But it's a closed system. And so today we're going to see an open system, which I'm going to call hop parser. Here's the example I would like you to keep in mind, the problem, uh, prototype problem that we're going to solve. We want to get a web user's input. We're writing a graphing program. They will put in a mathematical function, and we will graph it for them. So they put in something like that. like this, and that represents a function, and then we will generate a graphic and display it on the web page. Any question? It's okay. The easy solution, we take their input, we pass it to eval, which will compile their input into Perl, compiled Perl code, maybe a function, then we execute the function. Problem solved. Talk is over, let's go have lunch. <laughs> but really, you shouldn't be laughing, you should be screaming. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, ah, the suffering, ah! Right, because everybody knows what can go terribly, terribly wrong. Well, lots of things. Uh, one thing is that, well, maybe instead of putting in a function like this, they put in system rm minus rf slash, and then when we graph it, it also erases our disk, which is what they wanted, but maybe not what we would like. But even if we can do it safely, it still has some problems. For example, in Perl, this notation, this caret, does not mean uh, exponentiation, does not mean x squared, it means bitwise exclusive or. And maybe we would like to supply functions that are not predefined. And I'm sure you can think of many other examples. So what we would, uh, our alternative is, we will implement an evaluator. It will read a string like this, translate it into an internal representation of an expression, and then evaluate the expression at various points to calculate the graph. The output, the input is the string, and then the output is maybe it's compiled machine code, much faster than using eval in Perl. Or maybe it's an abstract syntax tree, which is a representation of the expression that we can then do many things with. Or some special data structure that I do not have enough imagination to think of right now. Or maybe it's an object from a Perl expression class, or could be anything else. Questions? Comments? Remarks? Suggestions? Announcements? <laughs> Manifestos? Get on with it! To represent a language, uh, uh, a language is a form for, uh, for inputs, and to describe the form of inputs, we use a thing called a grammar. Who has seen something like this before? Who has never seen anything like this before? Who maintains a prudent silence? <laughs> this means an expression is a parenthesis followed by an expression followed by a closed parenthesis or a term followed by either a plus sign and an expression or nothing. What is a term? A term is a factor followed by either star and a term or nothing. What is an atom? It is a number or a variable or a function name followed by parenthesis, followed by expression, followed by parenthesis. This is a grammar. It describes the syntax of the language we would like to parse. 
First, our program must identify things like numbers. It has to take the character input and figure out what's a number, what's a variable name, what's a function name, what's a parenthesis, what is a plus sign. The idea here is we will pre-process the input, we'll turn it from a character string, from a sequence of characters, into a sequence of tokens. Each token is an atomic piece of input, an indivisible piece of input. For example, sign variable x plus sign or this number. People do this when they read. First, we don't read the letters one at a time, or we don't read the, uh, the kana one at a time. We assemble them in our minds into words, and we understand the words as entire units. Then, we try to understand the grammatical structure of the sentences based on what the words are. Assembling the characters into these tokens is called lexing. Lexing is mostly just simple pattern matching. Perl has special features in its regex engine just for lexing. I don't have time to explain them. They're in my book. They're also in Jeff Friedel's book. We're going to assume that we have already pre-processed the input sequence and used pattern matching to decompose it into a sequence of tokens. Each token is a little anonymous array with a token type as the first element, say number, and an optional value in the second element, three. So this is this piece of the input turns into number three. This turns into star. Star has no value, so the second element is missing. This is recognized as a function name, so it turns into function token, value is sign. Any questions? The slides are on the web. There's a slide showing sample code that does this. It's after the main slides. You can look at it. Hmm. Also, we'll have some utility functions. This function takes a token and returns its token type, number, or variable, or parenthesis, or function. This function takes a token and returns its possibly missing value, 3, or 2, or x, or sign. Questions? Our parser is going to work by a technique called the recursive descent parsing. This is not the only way to parse, but it's an easy way. This is the strategy used by parse rec descent also. Recursive descent, rec descent. Now you know why it's called that. Each grammar rule will become a function. So we have grammar rules named expression, term, atom. We'll have functions called expression, term, atom. The expression function, its job is to read as much of the token stream as it can until it recognizes a complete expression. Then assemble the value for the expression, the representation for the expression, and return it. That's if it succeeds. What if it reads the input and it does not see a valid expression? Well, then it returns undef. What else? So. Suppose we have a grammar rule like this. An expression is a this or a this. We'll have a function called expression and a function called term. The expression function, what will it do? It will look at the first token. Its input is the token stream. So its argument is the token stream. It looks at the first token and it says, oh, is it a parenthesis? If it is, then it says, oh, I need to see if what follows is an expression. How does it do that? It calls the expression function recursively. It calls expression. And if expression succeeds, it says, okay, I've seen a parenthesis and an expression. Is the next token a closed parenthesis? And if so, it says, good, I've seen an expression in parentheses. I'll take the value returned by this function and I'll return that. I succeed also. Questions on this? It's okay? Is it not okay? What? Okay, all right. What if it does not see a parenthesis? Or what if this recursive call fails? Well, then it tries the other alternative. It says, all right, well, that didn't work. I'll try calling the term function. If that fails, then the expression function fails. But if it succeeds, then it looks to see, well, is there a plus sign? And if so, then it calls itself recursively for another expression. 
And if that works, it takes the value that it got from term and the value that it got from expression and it builds them into a larger expression object, which it returns. This is the idea. So that was a pretty complicated description, but it was really an assemblage of only a very few very simple operations. Only a few things that these parsers have to do. They have to say, well, is the next token, is it a certain one, and is it a plus sign or a parenthesis? And if so, okay. They need to be able to choose alternatives. Well, I'll look for this, and if I don't find this, I'll try looking for that instead. They need to be able to look for sequences. Well, I'll look for this, and if I find it, I'll look for that next. And if I find that, then I'll look for this other thing afterwards. And they also need to be able to say, look for nothing, because we had a, a nothing item in one of those rules. Not looking for nothing is very easy. If you're looking for nothing, you find it everywhere. There it is. Those people were in the next room. That's really uncanny. How did you do that, Miyagawa? Are, are they watching on closed circuit TV? All right. Should I go faster? 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 So just keep it this, this space. This space is fine for everyone. Yeah. Thank you. So a parser in this module I'm going to develop will be a function. Its argument is a token array, an array of the incoming tokens. It's going to examine some of the tokens at the beginning of the array, possibly making calls to other parsers. If it likes what it sees, if it sees something in the right format, it will manufacture, it will construct a value and then it will return that value and whatever tokens from the stream that it did not use, the remaining tokens, so that the caller knows where to pick up. If it doesn't like what it sees, it will return undef. First, we'll deal with nothing. How do we parse nothing? Well, nothing is very simple. It's a parser function, so its argument is a token stream. And since you can find nowhere, nothing, you can find nothing anywhere, it always succeeds and it returns a value, it's just a dummy value, and the remaining tokens, which is all of them. The next simplest parser is a parser that just looks for one particular token. We say, okay, the next token must be a plus sign. We'll use this function to recognize that situation. Look for plus. Its argument is a token stream, and the first thing it does is it gets the first element off the token stream. And if the type of the token is the thing it's looking for, plus, it says, that's good. I will succeed. I'll return a value. Really, this is a dummy value. And the remaining tokens, the rest of the stream. If the first token is not a plus, I return undef to indicate failure. Simple enough, yes? Similarly, this token, uh, sorry, this parser, wants the next token to be a number. And again, it gets the token stream, it gets the first token. If the type of that token is a number, it succeeds, returning the number value of the token and the rest of the tokens, otherwise it fails. So here the value is actually useful, here it's just kind of a dummy. Any question? Now, we don't want to have 37 of these look for functions that all look exactly the same, one for each kind of token, so we're going to use a trick. Rather than write however many we need, we'll have them built as required by another function. There will be one function called look for. You call look for plus, and it manufactures a parser function for you that will look for pluses. Or you can, instead of this look for number from the previous slide, we'll call look for number token. And it will manufacture a look for function that looks for numbers. And how does this work? Here's look for. The target, the thing it's looking for, is its argument. 
then it manufactures a parser function, anonymous parser function here. This is an anonymous function stored in dollar $parser, which will be returned. And what does that anonymous parser function look like? Well, it's a parser function, so its argument is a token stream. It gets the first token, checks to see if the token type is the target that was specified at the time this function was created. And then, if so, it succeeds, returning the value of the token. If not, it fails. Questions on this? So instead of nine functions, we have one function that manufactures parsers to order. Question? Yes? To a variable beside before returning it? Brian, uh, ingi.net wants to know why I have assigned this to a variable before returning it. Why not just return sub? And the answer is that I found long ago when I give talks at conferences that people are puzzled by return sub. So now I put it in a variable and then I return and then nobody asks a question, except this time. <laughs> It backfired. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> that was a serious stuffing question. I wasn't sure if there was. No, no, I'm, I'm quite, I'm, I'm not making fun of you. I'm just, I'm. <sighs> Actually, being able to ask Dominus a question because, you know, you can, just get completely flamed because, you know, I was laying myself out there, you know. Do I, do I flame people who ask questions? It depends. <laughs> depends on the day. Huh. Today doesn't seem like one of those days. But, so that's why I kind of crept out of my hole, asked my little question. I'm going to creep can we back go in my on? hole now. Can we, can we move along, please? Yeah, I'm going to oh, go back oh. in my hole. And, yeah, all right. You okay. go back in. Yeah. Any more questions? Does anybody want to be flamed? Gee, I, I, I'm, the only sure way to get me to flame you is to ask your question and point your hand over here and so I can't really see it. Uh, well, I have the rental cell phone from the airport and I don't know how to put it in silent mode. So I can't flame anybody for having a ringing cell phone because it might turn out to be my cell phone. Now we'll go on. This is where it starts to get interesting. Just for a moment, we'll pretend the example is a little bit simpler than it is, that there's only one rule for atoms. An atom is always a function followed by parenthesis, followed by an expression, followed by another parenthesis. We could write an atom parser like this. Here's an atom function. Its argument is a token stream. And then what does it do? It builds a look for functions parser that looks to see if the first token in the token stream is a function token, this function token. And if so, then the value will be the name of the function, and we also get back the remaining tokens, which we pass to a parser that looks for a parenthesis. And if that succeeds, it returns a value we don't care about, and the remaining tokens, which we then pass to the expression parser, which, if it succeeds and finds an expression at that point in the input, returns a value that represents the expression and the remaining tokens, which we pass to a parser that looks for the close parenthesis, which if it succeeds, returns a value we don't care about, and the remaining tokens. Then we build a new expression value based on the name of the function that we recognized and the argument expression. Maybe we actually call the function at this point. Maybe we build a code tree. Maybe we generate some assembly language. I don't know. And however we've built that value, we then return it and the remaining tokens from the last call. Questions? No questions. That's either very, very good or very, very bad. <laughs> this is the best point in the talk to ask questions because if you fall off the bus here, you won't catch up. It's OK? If any of those things fails, then our parser fails also. So we could write atom like this, but many other functions that we will have to write will follow the same pattern of 
call on the initial tokens and get back some more tokens and pass them to the next parser, which gives us back more tokens, which we pass to the next parser. So instead of writing many functions like this that all follow the same pattern, we're going to write one function that takes a bunch of parsers as its arguments and assembles them into one big parser in this way. Given parser functions A, B, C, D, we'll have a function called conk. We'll pass A, B, C, D parser functions to conk as arguments, and it will give us back a parser that looks for A, and if it finds A, it looks for B, and if it finds B, it looks for C, and so on. Conk is short for concatenate. Hey, Dominic, I have a question. Yes, please. I know. First, I explain in Japanese. Oh, あの, oh, oh, that's a relief. Ampersand is a little bit of 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 a little bit at least it's a little confusing I mean, in, in, in the if stand. Oh. Just a low priority uh, and. You're worried about the precedence of and compared with the yeah, equals exactly, operator yeah. here. Maybe I blew it because this code was never intended to be run. And, okay. <laughs> right, because I'm not going to do this, I'm going to do this. So when I constructed my example, since it wasn't something I was going to do, I didn't run it, so maybe it's wrong. And I need a and D here. Okay. And how come I'm calling it conk instead of cat? How come you're called Dan and not Fred? <laughs> From now on, you can be Fred.net. And I will change the slide later to say cat, okay? Because in English, concatenate begins with conk, not with cat. I've always wondered why they called it cat and not conk. I once gave a talk in Belfast and they asked me why Perl variables begin with dollar sign instead of pound sign. <laughs> And I said, because Unix was invented in New Jersey. <laughs> and then he complained about it. Sometimes you can't make anybody happy. Uh, I, I don't know, it never occurred to me to use cat. Then I, I could do the other one, there's gonna be another one coming up, and I could have called it, no, well, let's see, all right. We should move on because, oh, you know, time is going really well here. I have only um, 85 slides. <laughs> uh, so here's, here's cat, I mean conk, <laughs> and its argument is uh, zero or more parsers. Gee, I hope this will work properly with zero parsers. I didn't think about it carefully. Well, the one in the book works properly with zero parsers or one parser, but normally we expect there to be at least two parsers here, P for parsers. I love single character variable names. In the United States, this makes people hate me. But maybe in Japan, it will make people love me. I don't know. All right, it returns, it gets the array of parsers and it's going to manufacture a new parser function and return it. And what does this new parser function do? Well, it's a parser function, so its argument is a token stream here. And it has an array of results from the sub parsers and for each parser uh, that it is concatenating, it does what? It calls the, that parser on the current token stream and gets back a resulting value and a new token stream, T new for tokens new, uh, or fails. And if it fails, it can just return immediately. But if the sub parser succeeds, it takes the result and puts it in an array. It says, all right, the current tokens are now the new tokens. And if it does that for all the parsers, if each parser in sequence succeeds, then it returns the value, which is just an array of results, and the final token stream. And now, 
atom, instead of being that 11 or 12 line function we had before, is just concatenate these four parsers. Look for a function token, look for parenthesis, look for an expression, look for close parenthesis. Any question? And then similarly, we had a rule here that said, okay, an expression could be a parenthesis followed by expression followed by close parenthesis, and the direct translation of that is expression is concatenation of this parser, this parser, and that parser. Whoops, no, this does not quite work. Because uh, until you do the assignment, this value is undef. So what do we do about that? Well, we use the Y Combinator, of course. That's a joke. Only one person laughed. No, of course we do not use the Y Combinator. The Y Combinator is only for people with giant bald heads that come out with pulsating brains pulsing through their foreheads. All right, now two people are laughing. No, all right, we cannot use expression before we've defined it, but we can pull a very, very tricky trick. The trick is we're going to define a thing called a proxy parser, which will postpone the use of this until we have defined it. Here's the tricky trick. Here's the real parser. Here's the proxy parser in capital letters. Maybe that kind of typographic distinction doesn't work well in Tokyo. Is that okay? It's all right? It's not like you look at them and they look identical to you? Well, I don't know. I didn't want to admit this before, but since Inge brought it up, I always do my slides in EBCDIC. <laughs> anyway, the proxy parser does what? Oh, it's just a function which, when it's called, takes its arguments and passes them along to dollar expression. Now, that's okay because if we call this now, it's too soon because dollar expression here is undef. But that's okay because we're not going to call it now. We're going to call it later. We're going to say, Expression is the concatenation of look for parenthesis, look for an expression, look for close parenthesis. And later when we call this, that's okay, it will work. So we've postponed the evaluation of this until the time it's needed, until actual runtime. Isn't that a clever trick? The people with the giant pulsating brains call this eta conversion. Don't ask why. We're going to call it proxy parser. So. The upshot is, it's not hard to solve this problem. You solve every one a problem like this in the same way every time. Now, atoms come in three varieties, not just one. As I simplified it before, we're going to go back to the full definition. An atom could be a number token, a variable token, or this function parenthesis expression parenthesis. So we need the atom parser to try three different things. First, it's going to look for this. If it doesn't see that, it will try this. If it doesn't see that, it will try this. We could write code something like this. Fortunately, there are no AND operators there. The input token list is in. We'll have variables for the result and the output tokens. Alt3 is the third alternative here, which is look for a function token, a parenthesis, an expression, and a close parenthesis. And then we say, okay, well, take the input tokens and see if they begin with a number. And if so, we got a result and a result token list, which we return. Otherwise, try looking for a variable token. If that works, return the result. Otherwise, try the third alternative. If that works, return the result. Otherwise, fail. Okay? But once again, clearly we're going to have to write many functions according to the same pattern. So instead of writing many similar functions, we will write a meta function that will take small parsers, A, B, C, D, and assemble them according to this pattern. So if we've got functions A, B, C, D, then alt A, B, C, D will take A, B, C, D as arguments, and it'll build a new parser for us, a new parser function, which will first try A, and if A works, it's done. Otherwise, it tries B, and if B works, then it's done. And otherwise, it keeps going until either one of them works or none of them work, and then it fails. Dan wants me to call conk. He wants me to call it because it's concatenate. He wants me to call it cat. This is alt, which is alternate. So I guess you want me to call it turn. 
turn, but that turn goes with cat, because cat is a little animal with feet, and turn is a kind of a bird. So we'll call them cat and turn. And if the cat doesn't eat the turn, then then everything will be all right, except that nobody will know what I'm talking about because the slides say conch and alt. Thank you, Fred. Here's turn, uh, alt. Again, it gets arguments, which is a list of parsers that it will assemble into an alternation, alternatives, and it builds a new parser an anonymous function which it returns, and what does this new anonymous parser function do? Well, it gets its input token stream, and then it tries the argument parsers one at a time, and if an argument parser succeeds returning a result and result tokens, then we win, and our function returns the same result and the same result tokens. But if it gets through the loop and none of the argument parsers work, none of the alternatives succeed, then it fails. Any question? All right, everybody's happy. Everybody wants to eat lunch. So once we have alt and conch, now here is a complete definition for Adam. Adam is alternatives. Either look for a number, or look for a variable, or look for, oh, look for concatenation of function token, parenthesis, complete expression, parenthesis. And when we're writing our program to parse expressions, we actually have, this is real code, and this, strangely enough, it runs. And here is for factor. A factor is an atom followed by either caret and a number or by nothing. It's the concatenation of the atom parser with two alternatives here. I thought I'd fix that. Uh-huh. Alternatives. The first alternative is the concatenation of a caret and a number token. So look for caret followed by number. Or the other alternative, this is backslash ampersand nothing. Look for nothing. That's the reference to the nothing function. And my clever slide generator interpreted ampersand not as the logical not symbol. And I'm going to restrain myself from explaining to you why this is the logical not symbol. All right, so here's the parser for term. Ah, it was supposed to look like that. I see. And I noticed it, and I fixed it in one place, and I forgot to fix it in the other place. All right. Here's the definition of term. It's the concatenation of what? a parser for factors, and then either star followed by term or nothing. Any questions? Here's the parser for expressions. This is complete. Expression has three alternatives. Alternative one is parenthesis followed by expression followed by parenthesis. That's this. Alternative two, oh, I'm sorry, two alternatives. Alternative two is a term followed by either plus an expression or nothing. Well, this doesn't look so great, but on the other hand, compared with how much stuff it's doing, it's really very, very small. It's only a few lines of code. It's doing something extraordinarily complicated. Try to imagine how you would write this without these techniques and what the expression function would look like, very big. And then if you want, if you don't like the looks of this, you can use operator overloading. We're going to overload hyphen to call the conch function and Perl's vertical bar operator to call alt. And then we can write expression equals, oh, and I'm going to abbreviate look for to L. Look for parenthesis, expression, parenthesis, or term followed by plus expression or nothing. Ta-da! So now we have two lines of code that look almost exactly like the grammar. But it's not a sub-language that you have to learn. It's actually Perl code. It obeys all the precedence rules of Perl code. You can use any Perl expression in it in any way that you want. It's just Perl code. So from now on, 
because the slides don't have that much space, I'm going to use this kind of notation. But if you don't like it, you can go back to the more explicit notation that looks like this. We've done a bunch of work here now to build the parser system. And it took me 42 minutes. And what are the advantages? What, why did we do this? We could have just used par parse rec descent. Well, it has some modular interchangeable parts. We can use them to build all kinds of different parsers. That's true. But so far, it has only gotten us to the same place that parse rec descent did. So instead of taking 42 minutes to write that code, we could have taken it to download and install parse rec descent. So is there any other benefit? Well, I think so. Let's see. Parse rec descent is a closed system. It is what it is. It does what it does, and it goes as far as it goes. But our system has just begun to get started. It can be expanded in many directions. Regexes have a question mark notation that mean an item is optional. We might like to say a term is a factor followed by optional star term. It's very easy to define a function optional that does this. Here it is, it's optional. It gets a parser as its argument. And it returns a new parser that says, okay, look for an instance of whatever p parses. And if you find it, that's good, return that result. But if not, it's also okay to see nothing. So here's our optional function. It builds a new parser. And now instead of writing this, instead of saying, oh, it's a factor followed by either star and term or nothing, we say, oh, it's a factor followed by optional star and term. Parse rec descent does this also. It has a question mark notation. Rec descent also has a star notation that means to repeat something. We can also implement repeat. I put it in the bonus slides at the end. I'm going to skip it now because of time. But the notation is very similar. Just repeat, and then the argument is a parser, and it builds a parser that applies the argument over and over again as often as necessary. Here's something that's very common in programming languages, lists of things, comma-separated lists of expressions, semicolon-separated lists of statements, or whatever. Here's a function called list of. It gets an argument parser, which parses a single item of a list. And it gets a parser that will parse the separators between the items. This is optional. If it's not there, then we will let it default to a single comma. And then it returns a parser, which does what? Looks for an item, followed by separator item, separator item, separator item, separator item, as often as necessary, followed by an optional trailing separator. Now we want to build a parser for comma-separated lists. We say, oh, a list is a concatenation of a parenthesis at the beginning, a list of expressions, a parenthesis at the end. And we've just written a parser for comma-separated lists of expressions. Here we didn't specify the separator, so it defaulted to comma. Semicolon separated blocks. It's a curly brace followed by a list of statements separated by semicolons followed by a closed curly brace. Parse rec descent does not do this. You can't build a function called list of that works in this way, I think. In the book, Higher Order Perl, I implemented a drawing system. It's a constraint-driven drawing system. You put in a specification, which is a text file, which specifies the diagram that you want to draw. Then it figures out where all the shapes should go and how to connect them, and it emits PostScript. The input language contains lots of constructions that look like this. Here's a constraints, and then in curly braces is a bunch of constraints. Or here's a definition. Define a square. It's like a rectangle, but Here's the definition. So I used an even higher level constructor, a function called label the block. It gets a parser for the header, that's the constraints or the defined square extends rectangle. It gets a parser for the items that can appear inside the block, an optional separator which defaults to a semicolon, and then it builds a parser for an entire one of these. A header followed by a curly brace, followed by a list of items and separators, followed by curly brace. And so here's the definition of the constraint block parser. Oh, it's a labeled block. It has a header, which is a constraints token. And, and then uh, it's a block with a bunch of semicolon separated constraints. And a definition is a labeled block that starts with a definition header and has a bunch of semicolon separated declarations.
Each parser then becomes a domain-specific language in which you define the kinds of parser constructors that are appropriate for your application. Parsing those expressions was not too uh, difficult, and it's a very common task. In higher order Perl, I develop an operator function um, that says, all right, here's a couple of operators that are part of the expression I want to parse. Please just build up the appropriate portion of the expression. So you give it plus and minus, and you tell it how to construct the values for plus and minus, and it just puts the parsers together for you into a more complicated type of expression that now may include plus and minus. And then you take that, and you hand it to operator times divide, and now it gives you back a parser that understands plus and minus and times and divide. And you give that parser to operator and say, oh, and by the way, add caret to this. And it gives you back a parser for expressions that may contain plus, minus, times, divide, and caret. And the order in which you do this specifies the precedence. So it's easy to build up expression parsers for many different operators. Building on top of that, we could build a single function, expression parser, which just, you give it an operator precedence table, caret, then star, then slash, then plus and minus, here are the functions for calculating the values for those things. Here's some additional specifications. This one is right associative. And here's what the atoms look like. This is a parser for atoms. And then it puts everything together in the right way and hands you back a parser for expressions. Chunk. This little tiny bit of code writes a function for you that will take an input that looks like this and will calculate the result. It handles the precedence correctly. It handles the parentheses correctly. It handles everything correctly. And you can take this and package it up somewhere and make it into a closed system that nobody has to understand. Or they can build on top of it. For various technical reasons, getting operators like division and subtraction to work properly in recursive descent parsers is quite difficult. If you were going to do this in parse rec descent, you would have to understand the technical tricks required to make it work. If you just do it in the most straightforward way, either you get the wrong answers, or parse rec descent fails, saying left recursion on line 157. <coughs> the operator function has the tricks embedded inside it, so you don't have to see them. So here we can embed tricks inside of parser generating functions and have the tricks hidden and encapsulated where we don't have to understand them further. We built up all of this machinery just by gluing together a very, very few, very simple tools. The look for function, conch, alt, total about 25 lines of code. The tools themselves were very simple. But if we need some other tool that's not provided by the module, it's similarly simple to build it. For example, suppose we're going to need a parser that says, I want to recognize something that looks like A but only if it does not also look like B at the same time. Well, the tools we have don't let you say that, but it's easy to build a tool that does let you say that. Here's a function called this, but not that. It gets two parsers as arguments, A and B. It builds a new parser, which it returns. What does the new parser do? It gets input tokens. It looks to see if the input tokens look like A. If they don't, it fails immediately. Otherwise, it looks to see if those tokens also look like B. And if they do, it fails, because we're looking for things that look like A, but not like B. If it does look like A and not like B, we return the result of A. And now we can call this function on any two parsers, A and B, and get a new parser that says, oh, it must look like A, but not like B. So it's easy to build tools of this sort. Only a few lines of code and all very straightforward. Here's one that turns out to be very frequently useful. Do, here's a, I want to build a parser that does just what A does, but only if the result returned by A satisfies some condition. Maybe I have a parser for numbers. And I want to say, I want a number, but it must be positive. So look, see if this is OK with A, and get the value from A, and then make sure that the value from A is positive. It gets a parser A and a side condition. It builds a new parser, which it returns. What does the new parser do? It gets the input, gives it to A. If A fails, then the new parser fails. Otherwise, test the condition on the result from A. And if the condition fails, then no, 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 no good. Number was negative, we'll fail. 
If it's good, then just return the result that A would have returned. So this is a parser with a side condition. Similarly, we could have a parser that says, do what A does, but take the result and transform it somehow. A very, very common thing to do. In my book, Higher Order Perl, I took the same tools and I put them to work parsing many different sorts of input. The expression parser is a very common example because it's such an ordinary thing to do. But you get tired of seeing expression parsers over and over again. So I tried to include many different examples. One of them is a parser that takes an outline, a plain text file where the indentation indicates structure. And it parses this structure, it parses this file into a nested list according to the indentation. So under languages, we have three sub-items, functional, imperative, object-oriented. And here's languages with a sub-item functional, imperative, object-oriented. And under object-oriented, three sub-items. So the same set of tools can be put to work doing many, many different jobs. Sorry if you're tired of this point, but I think it's really important. By providing interchangeable parts, we're not only enabling powerful parsers, but also ways for people to build tools to build even more powerful parsers. For whatever your application is, you can build a few little tools that make it easy to make the parsers for your application. It's like having a machine shop instead of a toolbox. If you don't have the tool you want, you can build it. And if you don't have the tool to build the tool you want, you can build it. Since the tools are simple, it's easy to make new tools. You put a small effort into making better tools for yourself, it has a huge payoff. Conway put a big effort into parse rec descent for you, but he's not going to come help you out if you need another feature. The functional programming style, which we've been using, where functions take functions as arguments and transform them or assemble them and return new functions, this enables the use of functions themselves as modular components. Functions like look for and concatenate manufacture new functions as needed. This is an extremely powerful way to program. I wrote this book about it because I think people need to do this more. It's really good. Uh, it was published two years ago. It's not like any other book, I guarantee you. There is hardly anything in it that is in another book that you have already. Chapter eight is about parsing. It's 90 pages long. I couldn't shut up. I had to leave out a lot of good stuff for the talk. Um, for example, I completely left out the important issue of backtracking. Parsers won't work if you don't build backtracking into them. I couldn't have done backtracking in six minutes. I'm hoping that I will have the book online in the next few months. I've been planning since it was published to put it entire text online, but I just haven't done it yet, but soon. Anyway, that's the end of my talk. We have some time for questions. The slides are now online here, including the ones I didn't cover. There's some example code from the book at this URL. Does anybody have questions about anything? Does anybody have questions about anything we, we did not talk about? Questions about anything whatsoever? Yes, ingi.net. Do it, do it net. It's kind of funny that last example looked something like wiki text, that outline. And um, at work, I've had, for the last month, I've developed a new parsing technique that's um, it's, it's quite different. And all of the people at work say, why don't you use traditional parsing techniques, much like you've shown, and I go, and I came up with a failing test of, and I'd like to show it to you later to say, see if your techniques could actually be applied to that type of parsing in a sane way, that would be better, but I guess that's not really a great question. That's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. I'll, 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 I'll give it to you then. Um, so some, some things are based on tokens that you can scan through, and it seems that your parsing was built on this. In some wiki markups, you actually do blocks where you say every line is maybe fanged, like an email. Say, could you, um, and then under that, you might have indented sections that have yet another kind of intended thing, like table, like a table laid out with maybe pipes or something like that. Um, could that type of parsing be applied well? Could your type of parsing be applied well to those situations? Yes. Thank you.
Yes, the gentleman in the blue shirt, please. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you mean, but the question is, could I write a parser to parse the logic definitions that I have at the top of each page? Oh, you want a parser that takes a grammar as input and builds a parser according to the grammar. Yes, you absolutely could do that. Sure. Yes. Yes, you could. Uh, I haven't done that because I like writing Perl code. Um, but yeah, that, 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 that can and has been done, and, uh, and it's often a worthwhile thing to do. えっと、最初、インギーの質問 パールの行動を生成してえ、やれば、コードを書かなくて、あの、ま、論理、アルゴリズムだけ書いて、あとはそれをパールコードに変換することができるんじゃないかっていうことで、ま、それもできますっていうことですね。はい。Thank you very much.